ברוכים הבאים, וולכן נשב עם פנים לתורה, to the 70 faces of the Torah, and also סולם יעקב. This week's Torah portion is פרשת ויכרה. ויכרה in Hebrew means the calling. Now in English we translate it as Leviticus, which is a reference to the Levites, as the Chumash of Vayichra, or the book of Leviticus, is known to deal with all of the temple system, the, what's known in Hebrew as the korbanot, or sacrifices, though so that word sacrifice is not equivalent to the Hebrew word korban, but mostly deals with the entire temple system. I've subtitled this teaching, Kingdom of Priests, or as it's known in Hebrew, Mamlechet Kohenim. And right before we delve into the teaching, I want to remind everybody that if you were blessed by our teachings here, Esulam Yaakov, and you'd like us to continue to bring you these teachings available through social media, uh, prayfully consider supporting us. As we see there from Masechet Sukkah, Chazal mentioned Gadah HaOseh Sadacha Yotem Echol HaKorbanot, that one who performs Sadacha, that that act is greater than one who actually performs a Korban. And speaking of Korban, that is the topic for today's Shior, for today's teaching on Parashat Vayichra. Now, what most people don't realize is that the entire book of Leviticus is, from one, greatly misunderstood. Two, it's taking on a context. And the reason why it's taking on a context is because it's misunderstood. And there's so much depth that's contained in the Chumash of Vayichra that if you don't know how to properly study the entire Avodat, uh, the entire temple service, and be familiar with it, you're going to miss great valuable information that's contained. And most people, they come to this faulty understanding because they were taught, and some still hold to the belief, that the temple system is a archaic system that was done away with. It's a uh, ancient system that Jews used to abide by. And since the temple was destroyed, none of this information is relevant. However, that is not true. And I've taught this many times in the past, that even in absence of a physical Behamikdash, physical Korbanot, that many of this information that's contained in the Torah these serve as microcosms for man himself. And we shall demonstrate that with God's help today in this class. Now, it's customary in many observant homes that when children are introduced to the study of the Torah, they are first introduced to the Chumash of Ayichra. I know in the non-Jewish world, a lot of children, when they are introduced to Bible concepts, a lot are introduced to the very... Uh, elementary depiction of Noah's Ark, right? The animals and Noah. That concept is not actually applied in the Jewish world. Instead, children are introduced to the Chumash of Vayichra. And that's very interesting because why Vayichra? Why not another Chumash, uh, another Sidra in the Torah? Something that would be considered more kid-friendly, right? Why expose the mind of an innocent child to instructions in the Torah that deal with sacrificing animals, something that would appear to be very gruesome, right? Why? Well, one of the reasons why observant homes have their children study Vayichra is because Israel as a people are known as a Mamlech Konim, as a kingdom of priests, and this is Obviously, a reference to what we find in Parashat Yisro, Exodus 19:6, in which Hashem spoke to the Jewish people, and He says, "Ve'atemti you konim ve'goy kadosh, you will be to me a kingdom, a kohenim, a priest, and not only that, a holy nation, ele hadavarim." And these are the words Hashem to Ber El Bnei Yisrael that you shall speak, Hashem telling Moshe to Bnei Yisrael to the children. Of Israel. Commenting on this passage, the Sfano in his Perush, he said this, this will make you special, for only you will be a kingdom of priests, by teaching and instructing all of mankind to call out in the name of God, and for all to serve him together. 
This was to be a forerunner of what will happen in the distant future as predicted by the prophet Isaiah, Yeshiahu, specifically chapter 61, verse 6, in which it states there, and you will be proclaimed as Kohanim, meaning Israel, of Hashem. This is also the true meaning of what's brought down in Isaiah 2 through 3, Ki mitzion tetzei Torah, that the Torah will go forth from out of Zion. And therefore, this statement, as it says in brackets, is attributed to the nations of the world at that time, in which, if you will, the anticipation of the nations coming to a conscientious awakening of the true and living God. This is when the nations will come to seek Hashem, and obviously they will do it through the Jewish people. Now, the Midrash, it comes along to answer my original question. Why is it that in observant homes, a Jewish child is first introduced to the Chumash of Aichra instead of, let's say, some other book in the Torah? And the Midrash explained the reason why children are taught the Chumash of Aichra is because of their purity and that the existence of the world depends on learning the laws of purification and the korbanot. And this is brought down in Midrash Tachuma to Parashat Sav. And this is over here, Amar Rabbi Asiya. Rabbi Asiya said, why do children begin? Lama Chaim, the learning of the book of Leviticus, of Vayichra. It is because all the korbanot are written in it. And because the children are pure, and do not know the taste of sin or iniquity. Therefore, the Holy One, blessed be He, said that they should begin first with learning the section dealing with the laws of the arrangement of Korbanot. Let the pure ones come and become involved with the process of purification. Yavo'u tehorim, vayit aseku tehorim. Therefore, I consider it as though they were standing and sacrificing before me the Korbanot. And to inform you that although the Behamikdash has been destroyed and there are no longer any Korbanot, were it not for the children who read the laws of the arrangement of the Korbanot, the Midrash says, Lo hayaha olam omed, that the world could not exist. That's a very powerful statement. And so the Midrash is teaching that when children learn about the Korbanot, they are the causative factor for the existence of the world. Now, now that is very, very powerful. However, I also want to point out that the Midrash here is not just referring to literal Yeladim, literal children, okay? Yes, in observant homes, it is customary to teach one's child, especially the boys, the beginning of Torah, Okay, Mikra scripture, starting with Leviticus. But that's not just limited to physical children. Because children, Banim, okay, specifically, not just Yeladim, which is a small child, a Yeled or a Yelda, a boy or girl, etc. But Banim, in general, is usually a euphemism to refer to Tamadim, disciples, Tamadeh Chachamim disciples, students of the Torah. And Rashi, in his commentary to Parsha Ve'echanan, taught that Tamadim are considered children in Jewish thought. We turn here to Rashi to Deuteronomy 6-7. It says here, quoting from the passage of the Shema, in which it says that you shall teach them, Levanecha, okay, to your sons, right? And Rashi says, Elu HaTamadim, that here, Levanecha is a reference to Talmudim. And I want you to notice that it's in the plural, and that's important. Rashi says, We have found in all places that the Talmudim of a person are called Banim, called sons. As it says, Shnei Amar, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 14, verse 1, Banim atem la Adonai Elohechim, that you are sons to Hashem, your God. Also, in 2 Kings 2, verse 3, B'nei HaNeveim, the sons of the prophets who were Asher Beit El and Beit El. And also mentions here in 2 Kings 2.12, Cheskiyahu or Hezekiah, Shelemet Torah Lecho Israel, that when he taught Torah to Israel, he would call them Uchra Ambanim, children, Shene Amar. 
as it says over here in Devrei Hayamim Beit, that's Second um, Chronicles, uh, chapter twenty-nine. It says, "Banai Ata El Tishalu." And therefore, my sons, do not be negligent now. I know it's the Second Kings, which should say Second Chronicles, and the brackets in English. And then it says, just as the Talmudim are called sons, likewise, the rabbi is called father, as it says elsewhere here in Second Kings 2.12. And it says, it mentions over here, Avi, Avi, my father, my father, Rachiv, Israel, etc., the chariot of Israel, okay? So we see here in this passage that the reference to children is not just literal children, but it's also a reference to students of the Torah. Now Rashi's comment it has merit to it. Why is that? Because in the passage he's quoting from, in Deuteronomy, from the Shema, when the Torah says, Levanecha, it says, to your sons, right? It's in the plural. And that's not a literal reference to children, because had the Torah meant sons in a literal way, then it would have used the singular expression living cha, right? To your son, living cha. However, the plural expression levanecha is a reference to disciples, to Talmudim. And so when the Midrash speaks about learning the laws of purification, yavo'u tehorim vayit asikhu b'maaseh tehorim. Let those who come and be occupied in learning the laws of purification. The Midrash is not referring to a physical purification, something that has to deal with hygiene. Okay? Tahara and Tuma, which we translate as purity and impurity, those terms that we translate into English are not even properly translated because they do not have an English equivalent not even just in English, in any other vernacular that you could translate Tuma, Tahara, outside of Hebrew, there's a lack of equivalency to understand the origins of those words. And so most people may think pure and pure are different states of, uh, of, of hygiene, and that's not the case, okay? Tahara and Tuma are impervious to physical sensory. They are forms of energy that are related to the soul, and that's the best way that I can explain it. And so when the Midrash speaks about the existence of the world depending upon learning the laws of purity and the Korbanot, it's in relation to the soul that facilitates the movement of energy of God from the upper world into the lower world. And so you could be, uh, you know, a child of the Torah, right? Figuratively speaking, a, a bar mitzvah, right? There's a bat mitzvah, a son and daughters of the commandments. And you can be of a physical age of your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, etc. And yet you possess a consciousness that is merged in tahara, an energy of, of purity, per se, right? For lack of better uh, terms here, an energy that the conscious is in that is completely aware of being in Tahara versus being Tame, right? A energy of what we would call impurity. And so we see that those who are immersed in that state of consciousness, the entire existence of the world depends on these particular individuals. It's very, very interesting. The Midrash mentioned that this process can be accomplished without a physical Beha Mikdash or without physical Korbanot. Once again, these are an edifice and a system that existed going back 2,000 years ago, and even then, 2,000 years ago, under the Bayesheni, what we call the Second Temple, there were certain key Kelim vessels that were absent, like the, the Aron Habarit, the Ark of the Covenant, and things of that nature, and not only that, the, the oligarchy of corrupt Kohanim who presided over that temple were gatekeepers on behalf of Rome, also working in cahoots with the corrupt Herodian family and things of that nature. So there was a lot of things from that temple, per se, that was not really kosher, okay? And yet we see that in absence of that system, the concept of Tuma Tahara is still very, very much a true thing, okay? There are certain things that are very relevant about the Corbinote system 
in absence of the physical system itself. And this is very important for people to understand, which is also why it's customary in the morning that when one gets up to pray shahrit, they will notice as a prerequisite before the community prayer, if they're playing when, praying with a minion, you have mishniot, passages of the Mishnah, invoking certain korbanot, specifically upon the morning tamid. The Torah tells us that there was a mandatory tamid offering that had to be done in the morning for shahrit, and then later for mincha. And the korbanot make up a third of the Torah, and it just happens to be that we extract a third of the korbanot and bring it into our tefillot, into our prayer service. That's why there's a seder. There's an order. Okay, how we get the word sedur from seder, there's an order to our tefillah. Okay, to how the prayers are done. And mind you, there may be slight differences in the Ashkenaz and Sephardic world, you know, but there's an order pretty much that is agreed. And these are all extracted from out of the Corbinote system. Because essentially, the korban that we bring before HaKadosh Baruch Hu is us. We are that korban. And we shall see that a korban doesn't mean literally sacrifice, which is, once again, a lack of equivalency in translating from Hebrew to English. The system of the Beha Mikdash, the korbanot, the avodah, etc., people need to understand is that that system was a microcosm of man. This is important. Now, there was a well-known, or there is a well-known, machlokit dispute between the view of the Rambam and the Ramban, Mamanides and Nachmanides, regarding the purpose of the Beit HaMikdash and the Korbanot. According to the Rambam, the Korbanot were introduced as a medium to help wean the people away from Avodazara, from a form of idolatry that they grew customarily to when they were in Mitzrayim. And so this is brought down in his Mori Handevochim, which is translated as Guide to the Perplex. And this is what Mamandi says. Many precepts in our Torah are the result of a similar course adopted by the same Supreme Being. In other words, what he's saying is that Hashem use a system that the people were customarily with in order to wean them from that system. And so he is going to talk about here the Korban Oath. He says, it is namely impossible to go suddenly from one extreme to the other. It is therefore, according to the nature of man, impossible for him suddenly to discontinue everything to which he had been accustomed. Now, God sent Moshe to make B'nai Israel a Mamlech HaKhonim, a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. By means of the knowledge of God, the scripture says here, unto you it was showed that you should know that Hashem is God. And also Deuteronomy 5, 39, that you should know this day and consider it in your heart that Hashem is God. Hashem hu alukim. The Bnei Israel were commanded to devote themselves to his service. And it says in Deuteronomy, to serve him with all of your heart. And also in Exodus 23, 25, and you shall serve Hashem your God. And also Deuteronomy 13, 5, and you shall serve Him. Rambam continues. But the custom which was in those days general among all men and the general mode of worship in which the Bnei Israel were brought up consistent in sacrificing animals in those temples which contained certain images to bow down to those images and to burn incense before them. Religious and aesthetic uh, persons were in those days the persons that were devoted to the service in the temples erected to the stars, as had been explained by us. It was in accordance with the wisdom and plan of God, as displayed in the whole creation, that He did not command us to give up and to discontinue all these manners of service. For to obey such a commandment, it would have been contrary to the nature of man, who generally cleaves to that which he is used to. It would, in those days, have made the same impression as a prophet would make at present if he called us to the service of God and told us in his name that we should not pray to him, not fast, not seek his help in time of trouble, that we should serve him in thought and not by any action. And he goes on to say, for this reason, God allowed these kinds of service to continue. He transferred to his service that which he had formerly served, or excuse me, that which had formerly served as a worship of created beings. 
and of things imaginary and unreal, and commanded us to serve him in the same manner, such as Exodus 25, that we should create a dwelling place for his presence to dwell in. And also it says in Exodus 20, verse 21, that we shall erect an altar to him, specifically that this is an altar of the earth, Mizbeach Adama Taaseli, that for me you shall build this altar from the earth, which we will touch base on that passage a little bit later. And also Leviticus 1 2, it says, If any man brings a korban to Hashem to bow down to him and to burn incense before him, he has forbidden to do any of these things to any other being. For instance, Exodus 22, verse 9, He who sacrifices unto any God except Hashem only, he shall be utterly destroyed. And also Exodus 34, verse 14, For you shall not bow down to any other God. The Rambam goes on to conclude. Therefore, he selected Kohanim for the service in the Mikdash, the temple. And they shall minister unto me the priest's office. Exodus 28, 41. He made it obligatory that certain gifts called the gifts of the Levites and the Kohanim should be assigned to them for their maintenance while they are engaged in the service of the temple and its sacrifices. By this divine plan, it was effected that the traces of idolatry were blotted out and the truly great principle of our faith, the existence and unity of God, was firmly established. This result was thus obtained without deterring or confusing the minds of the people by the abolish, abolishing excuse me, of the service to which they were accustomed and which alone was familiar to them. Okay, so Rambam believed that the Corbinot were commanded as a means of service because the people of that time were accustomed to such a practice. They adopted the cultural ways of the Mitzrim, the Egyptians. Uh, they lost their way when they were down in Egypt. And so they became accustomed to these things. And this is a part of their habit. Okay. And so according to Rambam, the Korbanot, if you will, is not the primary objective of the Torah. It's not the primary objective which is why only specific people in a specific place can bring them. It's reserved only for the Kohanim, for those who are spiritually mature, those who can see the bigger picture. Additionally, they are meaningful and desired by Hashem only when the person bringing the Korban realizes the true purpose of performing what we would call a sacrifice, but literally is to karav, is to draw near to God. So while Rambam has received a lot of sharp criticism regarding his position on the purpose of the Korban Oath, a lot of people have overlooked an interesting statement he made. Rambam said that Hashem transferred to his service that which had formerly served as a worship of creative beings and of things imaginary and unreal and commanded us to serve him in the similar or like manner. So by commanding the Jewish people to bring animal korbanot, Hashem made an action of idolatry into an action of service. So it goes from avodah zara, some type of foreign worship, into an avodah, a service of worship of Hashem. Now the Ramban, Nachmanides on the other hand, he argued that since the Torah codified the korbanot under an a fire offering that was a satisfying aroma to Hashem, the Korbanot were a microcosm of man. And from the surface, students who look at the Rambam and Ramban on this topic, they may think that they're arguing two different statements here, two different cases. However, I believe that they're saying the same thing. It's just that the Rambam, on the other hand, he's saying that the Jews were accustomed to something that was more akin to a Vodazara. Hashem took that system, allowed the Jews to use it, and then once they became familiar with it, they started to see the true secret within it, which is essentially what the Rambam tries to argue in his commentary, and it we'll see here in a minute, and which, for the record, 
You have individuals like the Sforno, and I explained this in previous teachings, who mentioned that the existence of the Beit HaMikdash, the establishment of the Korbanot, these only came as a result of the Chet HaEgel, the sin of the golden calf. Before that, there was no need to actually create a system, okay, a physical Korbanot, or even a physical edifice that we call the Mishkan. And I explained this just from looking at the Hebrew, for instance, in Exodus 25.8, the command, the Torah did not say betochai, that they should produce for me a dwelling place that I may dwell betochai in it. It's betocham, it's in the plural. Okay, toch, in, okay, betocham, them. The idea was that God's desire was to dwell in Israel, not in an edifice. But because the nation was not zoche, they weren't worthy of this. Then, after the whole episode of the Goli Calf, we had to have a system introduced, implemented, which served as a microcosm of man's potential. And so, as that, the Rambam, Maimonides, mentioned that, obviously, a lot of the general public of the Jews, they couldn't get this. They came from another system, so Hashem is going to use something that they were familiar with to bring them into a greater truth. The Rabban, on the other hand, once again, as we're going to see here, he wanted to argue that this is codified in the Torah because it has a special meaning to Hashem, and ultimately it is a microcosm of man. Going here to the Ramban, he says the Leviticus 1.9, and it is more fitting to heed the rationale than to say concerning the Korban that since the actions of humans are consummated through thought, speech, and actions, God commanded that when a person sins, he shall bring the action component of his sin and confess his sin with his mouth, corresponding to the speech component, and burn the inyards and the kidneys, which are the organs of thought and desire, in the fire of the altar corresponding to the thought component. So here, the Ramban is saying that each of the specific parts of a korban of the animal, the specifically the choice organs and fat, that went on the altar, that each component of the animal that the Torah permitted to be offered corresponds to a component in man that man misappropriated and which he has to bring. And so, therefore, he's going a little bit more deeper inside the subject, and we're going to see that this actually has truth to it, there's merit to it, even outside of having a physical system of Korbanot or a Beha Mikdash. So he goes on to say in the next passage, and the legs of the offering are also burned corresponding to the person's hands and feet, which do all his work for him. And God commanded further that he shall sprinkle the blood on the altar corresponding to the blood of his soul. All this is attended so that the person should contemplate which he is doing all these things, and that he has sinned to his God and his body with his soul, and that it would have been appropriate that his own blood be spilled out, and his own body be burnt, if not for the grace of God, who has taken a substitute and a ransom from him in his place, that is, this korban, whether it's korban chatat, asham, ola, etc., right? And to allow that its blood should be instead of his blood. And therefore, it should be a life, nefesh tachat nefesh, life for a life. And the extremities of the limbs of the korban corresponding to the extremities of of his own limbs. Now, one of the things I'd like to say here as a little side note for some of my viewers who come from Christian backgrounds, this is not a rabbinical proof of justifying that you need a human sacrifice on behalf of your sins. This is not what the Ramban is saying here. The notion of the korban, of the animal, being a substitute for man is not so much that it serves as a literal substitute, because without having an inner knowledge of how the korban system worked, okay, the entire korban, which we're going to get into today, okay, one would arrive at this faulty understanding that suddenly the rabbi here says that, oh, there's a substitute, a life for a life, okay? What he's saying is that God's grace is that instead of man himself for suffering, he learns the errors of his ways through the process of the core bond that he's bringing. What does that mean? We're going to see, okay? The entire process that he participates in, bringing the specific core bond, which once again is the root of drawing near to Hashem, all right? 
and that when he experiences this process, this is going to allow him to draw close. It's not dry and cut that, oh, you failed, you committed an avera, a transgression, boom, here's a substitute for you. That's not what he's saying here, okay? It goes deeper than that, and I'll explain this. The process of the corporate note contained a sublime psychological lesson that was designed to spiritually transform the person who brought the respect of Korban. And we see this right in Parshat Vayichra. We'll go here to chapter 1, verse 5. Torah says, starting with the whole shechting, slaughtering of the animal, ben habachar adonai. He shall then slaughter the bull, lifnei adonai, before Hashem. That's very important, that language that the Torah is presenting. That this is deemed, this is legalized, this is codified as the proper way for one to draw near to Hashem. This is the method of doing it. Anything outside of this is what's called puzzle. It's invalid. And this is still relevant even without physical korbano today, as I'll explain. And it says, V'hichlivu b'nei haron. Okay? So when it says, V'hichlivu, okay, l'fnei Adonai, V'hichlivu, through this is how he draws near before Hashem. B'nei aharon ha-kohani. Okay? Who's authorized to do it? The sons of Aaron, who are called the Kohani. Et ha-adam. These would be the individuals who are going to help the recipient, the individual bringing the korban. Okay? It says, V'zaharku et ha-adam. They shall, some say dash, some say toss, some say sprinkle. Okay? V'zaharku et ha-adam. The blood. Where? El ha Upon the altar. And it shall saviv be all around. What does that mean? How do you sprinkle on all around? We'll explore that. It says, Asher Petach Ohel Moed, which is at the entrance of the tent of meeting, meaning that the altar has some type of proximity to the front of the entrance of the Ohel Moed, the tent of meeting, which would be later the Hechel or the sanctuary in which the temple was built, etc. So what a lot of people don't realize is that there's a process, there's a st- multiple stages were unfolded when one went to bring their korban. And I've taught about this in previous teachings as well in respect to explaining how certain kalim, if not all kalim, that are mentioned in the Torah are a microcosm of man, and I would encourage everyone to go back and take a look at those teachings. So here the Torah is telling us something very important. It says at the beginning of this verse, Vishachat. Okay? This is the process of what we call Shechita, of slaughtering. The Torah teaches that Shechita is a prerequisite for entrance into the spear of the Ohel Moet, of coming in contact with Hashem. Why is that? Because Shechita, it represents the sensation the, the, the cessation of all existence that is based on physical drives. It's about the negation, the nullification of the ego. This is the source of negligence and immaturity. The human whose nefesh, whose lowest aspect of his soul is present in the blood, serves him since he is only concerned with his physical existence, his base impulse and drives. Such a person has not ceased to live from himself and not subordinate himself to the kingdom of Hashem. One who seeks to draw near to Hashem by means of a korban will desist from such selfish existence because it's not about them. And so this individual dedicates an animal as a korban as a means of self-expression. And since it is clear to him that one who seeks Hashem must seek him by way of the Torah, the way the Torah codifies it, not some other path of spirituality, he brings to the entrance of the Ohamoet a specific animal that the Torah stipulates, okay, as his means, his medium to come close to Hashem. And so in doing this, he attains a, a drawing near, a keruv, he comes close. 
And so the slaughtering of the animal, the shechita, is a microcosm of the nullification of man's egocentric being. This prerequisite must be, as the Torah said, lifnei Hashem, must be before Hashem, before His Torah, that is house, behind the parochet, the curtain, and what we call the Kodesh HaKodeshim, the Holy of Holies. And so according to the Torah, it's not the Ohamoet that affects this nullification, rather the person himself takes the initiative to nullify himself before Hashem. Because the source of one's nullification cannot stem from an external stimuli. It can't be from some external source of motivation. Okay, such as the sanctuary, the Ohamoe, it gets you 15 minutes of emotional excitement. But that emotional excitement can die down. It has to come from something deep within. Once this is done, then the Ohamoe will teach the person the proper ways of Hashem. And so, Shechita is a prerequisite for what we call next of Kabbalah. Kabbalah means receiving, but this is talking about Kabbalah Tadam, the receiving of the blood, okay? The receiving of the blood, that's the next stage of the Korban process. Shechita is the entry to a higher state of life and activity. Only when one has attained a higher and holier existence does he begin to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu. When the Torah speaks about Shechita, it's in relation to slaughtering what's called Ben Habakar. Okay? The Ben Habakar is considered the Korban Ola, the elevation offering. The beginning of Parsha Vayichra, when it begins, it teaches us that if we desire to draw close to Hashem, we must learn to sacrifice, literally draw close to Hashem from within. That's what the Hebrew literally says. Let's take a look at what our English translations say. And once again, this is why it's important to always learn the original language, because you're missing 80% of critical contextual information. Leviticus 1-2. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When a man among you brings a korban, or some translations say, sacrifice to Hashem, from animals, and that's not what it says in the Hebrew, it says from the animal, singular, definite article. From the cattle or from the flock shall you bring your korban, literally shall you draw near. So here the Torah says, Ki yahriv miken karban ladonai. And there's a lot of repetition here. The word karban comes from the root word karav, which literally means to come close, to draw near. Prior to saying karban ladonai, the verse says, Ki yahriv. Okay? Yahriv is from the same three letter root, karav. And so it's superfluous for the Torah to mention the word karav twice. What this teaches us is that our ability to draw close to Hashem depends on our korban. It's the korban that enables us to draw close to God. But there's a slight problem because the majority of all Bibles on the market don't translate this Hebrew accurately. Okay? And so most translations, as I just read, a couple moments ago, it say, when a man among you brings a korban to Hashem. That's not what the actual Torah says in the Hebrew. It doesn't say anything about a man from among you. Okay? It doesn't say that. Instead, the actual verse says this, For a man to draw near, he must so sacrifice, but it's draw near from within, okay? Only using sacrifice because, once again, it's what most people are accustomed to reading, okay? And it's a figure of speech here about learning to die to your ego. But he must draw near, ki yahriv mikem, from within. That's the literal translation of, I could say that. Mikem korban la Adonai. That's how he draws near, la Adonai, to Hashem. Then it says, min ha from the animal. Not from animals, but the. There's a definite article here. And there's different categories of the animal. Min ha-bakar, cattle. Min ha 
And then you have the flock. Tahrivu et karbanechem. This is how he's a draw near. With this form of drawing near. The word mikem means from yourself, from within. The Torah mentioned here animals that are permitted for korbanot in the singular, not in the plural. Why is that? If true sacrifice is internal, as the Torah taught, why does it mention behema, bakar, son? Why? Each of these animals are a microcosm of man. What do I mean that they're a microcosm of man? The specific animals that the Torah deems suitable, kasher, fit for an offering, reflect the personality traits that are also within man. Let me explain. Bakar, right? Bakar, we translate it as cattle. However, the word bakar is a permutation of the word kever. Kever literally means grave. And also boker, which means mourning, like boker tov, boker or. So what's the correlation between these permeations in relation to being, let's say, a korban chai, a living sacrifice? Well, when a person learns to die to self, nullification, right? Figuratively speaking, to their animal desire, the yetzahara, they put that ego into the kever, the grave. The bakar goes into the kever. The correlation between kever and boker teaches us that when we learn to die to the ego, there is a resurrection, okay? A tachia of the soul that corresponds to mourning, boker, right? And so from the kever, we experience a new mourning, per se. And while time doesn't permit me here, okay, with the study, once again, the nature of the animals chosen for the korbanot are not just random. Rather, these animals possess distinct features that are found in the animalistic drives of man, specifically his personality trait. And that's a topic within itself. So from Shechita, or through Shechita, the existence of Ben Habakar is nullified, where it becomes what the Torah calls an Ola. An Ola literally is elevation. Other translations will say a burnt offering because... It's a part of the offering that nobody partook of. The individual who offered it, the Cohen who oversaw the procedure, nobody received any benefit from it. In fact, in a way, a person who did an Ola was losing out because unlike, let's say, a Shalamim or a Korban Todah, Thanksgiving offering, somebody could receive benefit from it. An elevation offering is like a burnt. It's completely consumed. Nobody receives any benefit. But Ola is very uh, deep thought because... The root of Ola is from the root word Allah, which means ascension, like Aliyah, okay? One who ascends. And so when we nullify our animal desire, our soul experiences an ascension. There's an expansion of our consciousness. And due to the sublime concept, Jewish law teaches that when Shechita is performed, it has to be done with Kavanah. There has to be done with intention. The shochet, the individual involved in the slaughtering, must direct his mind to the korban sani before Hashem. If shechita is performed with one's mind on something else, well, then guess what? Let's say they take the korban ola and they're going to slaughter it like it's a korban chatat or a korban toda. Chazal says that that korban has done that way as puzzle. It's invalid. We see here in Masachat Zevachim 47a. From where in scripture is it known that the unwitting slaughtering of a korban is invalid? It is known from that which is stated here in Leviticus 1 5 that he shall vishachat et ben habachar, slaughter the ben habachar lifnei Adonai before Hashem. This teaches that the korban is not valid unless the slaughtering is performed for the sake, l'shem ben bachar, for the sake of a young bull. So, because the expression lifnei Hashem is there, that means, Shaviti Adonai Lenegdi Tamid, as it says in Psalm 16, I place Hashem before me always. That the consciousness of the person doing the Shechita process must have this in mind. And this is also why, on a deeper level, the Kohanim, when they performed the whole Avodah, they didn't need to be aroused with external stimuli like the Levites who were on the Dukin, the platform, before the public 
worshiping Hashem in beautiful song and melody, the Kornim did everything in silence. There was a silence to their avodah. And therefore, their attentions, their thoughts had energy to affect what would happen between the upper and lower realms. This is very deep. Going back here to Chazal, they comment on this further. And it's over here, uh, Amar Rabbi Shmuel uh, told Rav Huna that derivation was already in our hands. But from where do we learn that the Kavanah requirement is essential? And without its fulfillment, the Korban is invalid. He said to Shmuel, it's known from that which is stated in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 5. You shall slaughter it according to your will. Which is understood as meaning that you shall slaughter with awareness. Kavanah is determined, determined excuse me, only by the one who performs the Avodah. Once Shechita is performed, okay, the next process is the Hakarava, is the process of drawing near. The Hakarava process includes two steps. Okay, you have the Kabbalah Tadam, the receiving of the blood, and then there is the Holacha. Okay, the Holacha is the walking, all right, in which the Kohen is going to transfer the blood that he received in a Klisharet, a holy vessel, one that was designed to receive the blood. As you see in this depiction here, it was a it was a, a cup per se that had a pointed bottom, okay, a cylinder based object, and it was designed in this way so the blood would not congeal. So when the Kohen would transport the blood to the Mizbeach, as we'll see, not all Korbanot were treated the same, and I talked about this in previous classes, that some of the blood of a different Korban, different Korbanot, would be placed at different parts of the Mizbeach or the altar. So here, when the Kohen receives the blood, Kabbalat Adam, he would then walk, transfer, okay? Um, the blood, once again, in Kli Sharet, Sharet, excuse me, a holy vessel. And so he would perform the Holacha, the walking, bringing the blood to the altar. Now, what's interesting here is that the, the Kli Sharet, it sanctifies all of its contents and includes them within a spear of the sanctuary. What do I mean? Well, once the blood is received in this, this kli, this vessel, it's elevated. The holacha, the conveying of the blood into the spatal proximity of the altar is a physical representation of the concept of of drawing near to God. The Torah says the individual qualified to perform this avodah must be B'nai Aharon HaKohanim, must be of the sons of Aaron, the Kohanim. Now this is interesting, but why does the Torah need to tell us that the sons of Aaron are Kohanim? Isn't that a given? Who else are the Kohanim, if not the sons of Aaron? Well, according to Chazal, the term B'nai Aharon, it denotes an unblemished lineage that is spiritually whole. So in other words, it's not just describing genetics of certain individuals who are direct descendants of Aaron. It's also describing their spiritual character. We see here in Masech HaZevachim 13a. It says, B'nei Aharo HaKohanim, that what that means is that the Avodah receiving the blood should be performed by a qualified Kohen clothed in his priestly service vestments. Now I left an asterisk mark there because even the English translation of the Gemara here is not doing justice to what it says in the Hebrew, right? It doesn't say priestly service vestments. No, it says Ul Sharet. In other words, Chazal is calling the Big Day Kehuna, the garments that the priests wore, a Kli Sharet, very similar to the vessel that was used to perform any of the Avodah in the temple. That's very important, very interesting per se. Okay? These vestments, these garments, were called holy vessels, kali sharet, once again, which is classified in the same category of other holy instruments that were used for the performance of the korbanot. Chazal continued commenting on this in Masech Zevachim 13a. 
Amar Rabbi Kiva. Rabbi Kiva asked the question for where do we know that the Yavodah Chavalat Adam should be done by a qualified Kohen clothed in his Klishahrit? It's stated in Numbers 19.33 over there that the Bnei Aharon, they are called the anointed Kohenim. Just as the verse refers to a qualified Kohen clothed and his klisharit, so here too the verse refers to a qualified Kohen also clothed in his klisharit, his holy vessel, right? Holy vessel. Once again, the term service vestments, or in Hebrew, klisharit, is a reference to holy vessels used to perform the Yavodah of the Korbanot. By identifying the garments of the Kohanim as holy vessels, the Torah is teaching us that the garments of the Kohanim that they wore transformed them into a special, unique vessel when performing Avodat Hashem. And therefore, when the Kohen clothed himself in these garments, the Kohen did not appear as he was, right, as Aharon or Aaron or Nadav is Nadav, etc. But as he should be according to the dictates of God's Torah. In other words, the garments allowed him to be perceived in his true spiritual essence. Okay? Who he truly is, his etzim, his true essence. The garments, if you will, they brought to expression the character of the kahuna or the priesthood. Now what's interesting, I don't have it on the screen, but etymologically speaking, there is a connection in the Hebrew between clothing and character. There's a phonetic relationship between the Hebrew word begit and pakad. Pakad denotes investing in something when it's appropriate, with its appropriate attributes, something that contains a value that you're mindful of. The word begit, on the other hand, denotes not merely conveying, but clothing someone in a garment that gives him the appropriate appearance. So just as Paka denotes, if you will, not Paka like in fear, uh, Paka, excuse me, okay, denotes investing into office. Bega denotes the function of office. Now, when you think about this, the origins of clothing first appear in Parshat Breshit, specifically when Hashem clothed Adam and Chava after their transgression. And it's in Genesis 3.21, in which it says that Hashem produce these clothing for them, katonit or, it's a garment of or, sounds like light, ala vavresh, but it's ein vavresh, skin, because whatever dimension Adam and Chava existed in was a reality outside of this reality we existed in, their transgression caused them to materialize in a lower vibrational frequency, and therefore they were katonit or vayal bishem, they were clothed in these garments of skin. And so clothing is itself a reminder of man's moral calling. It is the first and most conspicuous indication of man's outer appearance, of his character. And so terms such as beget, uh, libush or lavage, and ata, these became expressions for a person's integration of certain characteristics or distinctive features, which, to the eye of the beholder, became that person's spiritual garment. In fact, such concepts are applied to Hashem throughout the Tanakh. What do I mean? Well, to better understand this, let's take a look at some verses. Psalm 93, verse 1, which we say on Friday, right before Shabbat, Adonai Malach, Geut Lavesh, Lavish, these are words of clothing. Adonai oz hit azar, af tikon tevel bal timot. He clothed himself with majesty. Hashem has clothed himself. He has girded himself with strength. Now, obviously, this is not literal. It's metaphors. We go on to Psalm 104, verse 1, in which we recite when we put on our talit in the morning. Barchinashi et Adonai Adonai Elohai Gedalta me'o chod v'hadar levashta Ote or kal shaman note shaman kariya Bless Hashem, O my soul, O Hashem, my God, you are very great. You are clothed in glory and majesty, wrapped in a robe of light. You spread the heavens like a tenth cloth. Also Isaiah 59, 17 
Vayubash Sadaka. He clothes himself with Sadaka, righteousness, like armor with a helmet of salvation. Yeshua Berosho on his head. Vayubash Big Day Nakam. He clothes himself with garments of retribution. He wraps himself at in zeal like it's a robe. And also Isaiah 61, verse 10. It says over here, for he has clothed me, ki, he'll be shani big day yisha, with the garment of salvation, and has covered me with the robe, sadacha ya'atani, the robe of righteousness. Psalm 139, verse 9, kohanecha yo'l bishu sedek, your kohanim clothe themselves in righteousness, corresponding to that. Second Chronicles chapter six verse forty one. Kohanecha Adonai Elokim, your Kohanim, Hashem. Okay, you'll be shu teshua are clothed in salvation. Also Psalm one thirty two verse sixteen. The Kohanecha Albish Yisha. I will clothe its Kohanim with salvation. So we see these passages here, and a lot of them are directed to Kohanim being clothed with a certain, uh, if you will, uh, a certain essence. And from these verses, we learn the priestly garments must express the character that the Kohen is to represent. It's a reflection of Hashem. They are dressed, they are dawned in power and spirit. So since the Torah identifies the priestly garments as Kli Sharet, it reveals that a sacred vessel receives an article for the needs of the sanctuary. So too, the Kohen assumes the service of the sanctuary by donning the priestly garments, the big day kihuna. Chazal explained that when performing the Kabbalat Hadam, the Kohen was required to execute the process with his right hand instead of his left hand. And we find this in Masachet Menachot 10a. It says over here, Amar Rabba Bar Bar Hana says, uh, excuse me, that Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish says, any place in the Torah which is stated that an action is performed with a finger or by the priesthood, meaning that one who uses his finger to perform the action or that a Kohen performs it, this teaches that it is performed with the right hand. Why the right hand? Well, in Jewish thought, the right hand represents the principle of unity, harmony, and also benevolence. And so in the Kabbalistic Lashon, language of Kabbalah, the Sphira Chesed of kindness is associated with the bestowing a general, general, generous goodness upon the world. And so the right hand represents the masculine energy of the Eluhut, what we call the Godhead. The right hand is also referred to, it's a reference to the Shulchan, okay, in the Hechel, which is associated with the north side inside the temple, the, the altar, but inside the Hechel, the sanctuary where you had the menorah, the altar of golden incense, the, the Shochan Lecha Panin, the bread of the faces. And I explained this in previous teachings, I'll touch base on it in here as well, that these were not objects just randomly placed anywhere, okay? It's not like Hashem hired the home decorator to come in and to ask their opinion about where to put the menorah, and it's not like Hashem needed the menorah, like He's going to get up for some challah in the middle of the night. No, uh, these were all here for man, specifically for the individual who was experiencing the entire korban. When they were bringing their respect to korban, they would, they would have a very, very deep uh, psychological lesson uh, they would experience, per se, uh, when seeing the whole korban done. Because there was no verbal communication when this was being done. They were absorbing everything, uh, you know, by visualizing, seeing what was going on. Uh, the experience was overwhelming. And so the right hand, the temple inside the Hechel, is associated with the north side. And the north side is associated with the material life. Okay? And it's also associated with the Shulchan Lecha Panin, the bread of places that represents materialism, prosperity, things of that nature. Opposite of the Shulchan is the menorah. That's the south side. That represents the left hand. It also represents spirituality. Okay? So after the whole halakha, the walking procedure of Kabbalat Adam after receiving the blood, 
the next process was zericha. Zericha, some call it dashing, some call it throwing. I translate it as tossing, okay, whatever. It had to deal with tossing the blood on a certain part of the Mizbeach, on the altar. And why I say a certain part of the altar? Because different korbanot, the blood would be placed in different areas. So a korban chatat, asham, etc. Okay? The blood was put on different areas. And I talked about this in previous teachings. And so this was the Zerlicha process. This process contained a symbolic meaning. It was not just a random ritual that the Kohenim used to do. In fact, we find in the Mishnah, the Masach HaZavachim 5.4, the sages address this issue in which they say over there, a haola regarding the Ola, the elevation offering that is codified, it's categorized as what's called the Kadshei Kadashim, the Holy of Holies, uh, as well as the Shalamim and the Chatat, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. It says here that it is Shechitata Batsafon. It's slaughtered in the north, meaning the north part of the altar. And the reception, the vikibud dama, the kabbalat, okay, dam, the receiving of the blood, is performed in a klisha, a holy vessel, as we just talked about, in the north. So all this is done in the north. And its blood requires two applications, meaning when you put the blood on the altar, that are equivalent to four. So in other words, it's multiplied here. And it requires skinning and dismemberment and is cosine. So this is talking about after the blood is drained from the animal uh, and the blood is put on the altar, obviously you had to remove the choice organs of fat that would eventually be thrown on the fire on the top of the altar and things of that nature. The Gemara comments on this. This is at each corner. Let's talk about the Mizbeach now. The Kohen makes one application in the form of the Greek letter gamma. What does that mean? We'll see that in a minute meaning that he throws the blood, tosses the blood, dashes the blood directly at that corner so that it spreads on impact to the walls on both sides of the corner. Now, once again, if a lot of people come to erroneous understanding of the Corbino system by just reading the Bible in English, or Leviticus, not Hebrew, they're not even getting the bigger picture without the oral Torah, okay, the Torah Shabbat Pei. Because we see here the Mishnah and eventually the Gemara brings you in an entire world of how the Avodah was performed. And we see this interesting statement in the Mishnah that when the Kohen would go and perform the Zerikha, the tossing of the blood, that he actually had to do it, if you will, uh, excuse me, the Gemara tells us, in a shape that it was done like the letter gamma in Greek, which is also very strange. It's like, why are we, why, why are we dragging the Greek language here? <laughs> What's going on? Which also shows you, you know, that the, that the Jews 2,000 years ago were very, very knowledgeable in the, in the language of Greece as well, in the Greek language. So what does this all mean? Well, let's take a look at some images here, some illustrations, so we can better understand what Chazal is saying the blood was thrown or tossed from a distance okay it reached all around like the letter gamma which is here on the screen this is gamma hopefully you can see it. I should have put a white background but if you if you know Hebrew okay the letter gamma here in Greek it looks very much like an inverted half sofif like and I didn't put that on the screen a half sofif which is the final so fief that of, a, of the letter kaf that's spelled at the end of a word, okay? It has a, 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 an ending form, okay? So the letter gamma looks like an inverted kaf so fief. And so the Kohen, basically, he would go around in this form, all right, this procedure, uh, basically to make sure that the blood reached all around. And it resembled the letter gamma or an inverted kaf so fief, on all four sides of the altar. This is being done. And so this depiction here, it shows you at the bottom left-hand side, you have a Kohen uh, at the Yisod, and that's important. I'll talk about this in a minute. You have the Yisod where the blood is initially being poured at. Okay, then you have two other Kohenim here. This shows you that there's olive point olive, point bait. Okay, some blood will be put at the top part and near the, the horns, the, the, the Karnot, of the altar, which is also called the Hariel, the mountain of God, etc. You have the, 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 the large ramp 
that you would go and bring the choice fats and organs to be thrown on the fire. You have in the middle, the deshin or the heap of ash through the daily sacrifices, especially if it was Yom Tov, you even have more carbonate being done, things of that nature. So this is an illustration of that, okay? And so eventually the blood was tossed against specific sides of the corners of the altar. And here's a somewhat of a bird's eye view sketch. And this is actually scanned from my Gemara here on it. And so it's not in English, obviously, but you have the Rashi script next to it. So you have Mizbeach in the middle, right? Showing you it's in a square. You have Mizrach, which is at the top, but that's literally the east side, okay? So that's facing east. You have the south, which is to your right. You have the west, okay? And then you have Safon, the north. Okay, so what we see here is that the Kohen would go and make sure that he would take the blood and sprinkle it, toss it, dash it, whatever term you want to use, against two diagonally opposite corners of the altar. And each one of those two tossings constituted what the Torah says is, Vizarekhu et hadam el hamizbeach saviv, literally tossing all around. That's Leviticus 1 5. That's what it means. So when the blood was tossed or dashed against one of the corners, it would spread to both sides of the corner. And when this was repeated on the diagonally opposite corner, the blood via the two tossing, sprinkling, etc., would have reached the four sides of the altar. Okay. Now what's important about this, and I'm going to go into detail here, I want you to notice... Uh, it's written in Hebrew there. It talks about the Yisod, the foundation. There was a foundation block, if I can use that term, that was on the west end and north end of the altar. And you'll see it. It's the outer part of the square of the altar. There, there's no Yisod going on the east, and there's no Yisod going on the south. That's very important because there was no blood applied there. The blood was applied diagonally to the altar foundation on the west and also the north and there's a significance to this okay there's a significance because the blood was only tossed against the northeast and southwest corners it was never tossed against the southeast and northwest corners the reason why the blood was never tossed against the southeast and northwest is because those sides of the altar never had a yesod they never had a foundation a base okay and I'm going to go back here to this screen. You'll see here, that is that is the altar from the south facing north or to the right would be the east where essentially you see the Kohen tossing the choice fats and organs on the altar. The Kohen at the bottom with the actual blood doing the Zerichah. That is actually the, the Yesod. And there's actually a hole in there where the blood will be drained. There's a unique system of draining the blood, kind of like a tunnel in which the blood would be gathered. And that's a whole other topic to talk about the engineering mechanics of the altar itself. Okay, because this is within the Beit HaMikdash, the Mishkan, if you will, it had a similar setup, slightly different to a degree. Okay, but that's for another topic. So nonetheless, this is where the blood would be applied. Initially, this had how it had to start. But there was no Yesod going underneath the ramp, nor Yesod on the east end there, the Mizrach. That's important. Okay, and Chazal comment upon this in my second Yoma. They want to know the question, the answer for what reason did the Kohen apply the Tamid, which is the required offerings blood, specifically to the northeastern corner of the altar and then to the southwestern corner. Let him instead apply the blood to the southeastern corner and then the northwestern. Why choose one set of opposing corners over the other? Well, they said the blood applications of the Korban Ola always requires the altar's base. And the southeast corner of the altar did not have a base. So here's another depiction of the altar, this time facing the east side. And you'll see there I circled in red. It says the Yesod HaMizbeach. It's the foundation of the altar. It's sticking out, protruding out like a little nub. There's none of it is running along the east end. Okay, it's not there. Okay, it's only in the north. It's only in the west. It's not on the east, and it's not on the south, which would run directly underneath the ramp of the altar. Okay? Why is that? Well, because it didn't have one. 
but there has to be a reason why. And there's a profound meaning to that, okay? There was a foundation base that was one ama wide and one ama high around the altar. This base, or yesod, as it's called in Hebrew, did not surround the altar on all sides. Rather, it extended out along the northern and western walls and looped around just one ama on its eastern side. So that's that little nub that you see here, circle in the red. This is a bird's eye view of it here. You'll see the nub sticks out on each of the west end and the north end. Okay, so the west end protrudes a little bit on the south portion, and then the north end protrudes on the east portion. So nonetheless, the south and the east had no yesod. Over on Masachet Zevachim, Chazal taught, via what's called a chova chomer, which is a comparison. If something's true in this manner, then it's true in that manner. It's from light to heaviness. It's a concept of Jewish hermeneutics. Chazal taught via chova chomer that the tossing of an Ola's blood had to be performed on a part of the altar surrounded by a yesoda, a foundation. The southeastern corner was excluded, and so by process of elimination, the only opposing corners that qualified the Corbin Ola were the northeastern and southwestern corners. When the Torah introduced the concept of the altar, this is important, when you absorb your mind into what all this means without a physical temple, Corbin Ola, etc., you have to go back to when the topic of the altar is first mentioned, and that's in Parashat Yithro, when the Torah first introduced the concept of the altar in Parashat Yithro, it identified the altar as Mizbeach Adama, an altar of the earth. And we go back here to Exodus 21, 21. Mizbeach Adama Ta'aseli. Hashem says, an altar of earth shall you produce for me. Okay? Vizavachta alav et olatecha. And you shall slaughter. It says near it, and that's deliberately put into the translation versus on it because you never literally slaughtered anything on the altar. Okay? It says you shall be your elevation, your peace offerings, okay, et of your flock, et of also your herd, your cattle. It says, wherever I permit my name to be remembered, avo elacha. And therefore, I shall come and I shall bless you there. Now, the expression here, Mizbeach Adama, means that the altar was a symbol of the earth's elevation to Hashem through the actions of man. This is so important, okay? The Torah did not say here, Mizbeach Shemaim Ta'aseli, you shall make a heavenly altar, or Mizbeach Ruchaniyot Ta'aseli, a spiritual altar. No, the Torah says Mizbeach Adama Taseli, an earthly altar. Here the Torah is teaching us that it is not our task to bring down what is heaven to earth. Because just suppose to this in verse 20, the Torah warned, Lo ta'asun iti Elohei kesef ve'elohei zahav, lo ta'asun lachem. Do not produce with me a God of silver, a God of gold, okay? Do not produce any of those things because Hashem is an incorporeal entity and you don't know what the infinite essence of the Creator looks like. So don't even try to imagine it. Okay? And not only that, we don't go trying to create things that are in the upper dimensions, which we don't fully comprehend. Rather, we're required to elevate everything on earth to heaven. To elevate it. The altar that the Torah commands us to build represents elevating earthly matters to God through our actions. Chazal commented upon this in Masach HaZevachim 58a. Why does the Torah say that the altar must be an altar of earth? This is to teach us that the altar must be attached to the earth and that one is prohibited from building it on top of any cavities or arches. It can't be like a private altar per se. So according to Chazal, if a small gap between the bottom of the altar and the earth was there, that altar is pasul, it's unfit, it's invalid, because it's not considered fully attached to the earth. Likewise, Hashem created man from what? The earth, back in Genesis 2.2. 2, 2. I don't have it on the screen, but Okay? 
Therefore, man must approach God from his earthly nature, from this physical reality, not some type of quasi-spiritual ideology that corresponds to some type of religious belief. That's not what the Torah commands. In relation to the altar, Hashem once again said there in that passage in Leviticus, or Leviticus Exodus 20, 21, alav, you shall slaughter upon it. But I translate it in English, you shall slaughter near it. Okay? Shechita HaKorban reveals that man must be committed to elevating his earthly nature. However, if the altar happens to have a defect at the time of Shechita, then the entire Korban is invalid. It's no longer fit. Chazal said in Masaka Zevachim, okay, if the altar became damaged, all of the holy offerings that were slaughtered there, meaning in the courtyard on the north side, were pesulim. They're no longer qualified. They're disqualified. In Masaka Chulin, Chazal explained that the altar becomes invalid if there is a small notch in one of the stones or a hole in the line between the stones. Once the altar becomes invalid, the animals that were slaughtered, they also become disqualified. Now, the altar in Hebrew is called Mizbeach. And I've told you before that most of the Bible translations of the word Korban call it sacrifice, which is not accurate. Mizbeach is from the root word Zavach. And Zavach literally means to slaughter. While the Torah says Vizavach Alav, there in Exodus 20, 21, you shall slaughter upon it. I translate it, you shall slaughter near it. And that's the reason why is because no animal was ever slaughtered directly on the Mizbeach. And depending on the type of the korban that was being offered, would determine which side of the Mizbeach the animals were slaughtered at or where the blood would be applied. Zavach denotes slaughtering to provide nourishment. Okay? Not slaughtering in the sense of killing. That's important. And so when we understand this and understand that no korban was actually slaughtered on the Mizbeach, we come to learn that the Mizbeach served as a spiritual source of nourishment. When we come before Hashem, we are required to elevate matters of the earth, okay, earthly matters. Through our physical actions, we learn to die to our ego, to our animal nature in order to ascend to Hashem. To better understand this concept and to appreciate the profound depths of the Torah, we need to understand the altar itself. This is very important. The altar rose level after level in three stages, okay, to a height of nine cubits per se. The base of the altar was about 32 cubits on each side, and on the top surface was 28 cubits. And so in two stages, the altar's width, it diminished. Okay, it's shortened by one cubit. And at each of the four corners above, which are what's called the cornot, we translate as the, uh, the horns, okay? The carnot, it's the singular word, carrot. Okay, the altar's horns, or rays of light, literally, they rose as cubes of one cubic cubit. All right, and I'm using rabbinical measurements here. The uppermost part of the altar... It's very interesting. It was actually called Hariel, literally the mountain of God. And it's a reference in Ezekiel when he describes the Baish Lishli, the third temple. Ezekiel 43, verse 15. And the heart area, okay, the mount of God is what it literally says in Hebrew, is four cubits. And from Umeha Ariel, from the Mount of God, four horns extend above. And that's talking about the actual horns, okay? These uh, four corners here, the Karnot. The two lower parts in which the Hariel rises stand in relation to the uppermost part known as the Ezrot. The lowest part of the Mizbeach, the Yesod, that's called the, the, the Katana Azara. That's the smaller platform. Above that is the actual Azara Gidola, the greater platform. The top surface of the Hariel, the mountain god, was also called the Ariel, the line of God. And this is also brought down in the mystical explanations of the Zohar 
that when the korban was being done, the image of a lion would appear in the fire. And it was upon the Ariel that the fire would consume the korbanot. The only part of the korbanot that was consumed once again upon the Ariel was the evarim, the choice organs, or the organs and the emorim, the choice fats. From offering the evarim and emorim upon the Ariel, we learn a very powerful insight for the Torah. Because the evarim, specifically the kidneys, they represent the lower desires of the body. The emorim represent the desires of the soul. And when one offers the physical and spiritual part of their being to the fire of Hashem's altar, they become united with Hashem. And that's why it's no coincidence. At the top of the altar, it's called Ariel. Okay, the lion is also called the Hariya, the mountain of God. Why is that? When one elevates their earthly existence to Hashem via the altar of Hashem, it's perceived as a lion that consumes the offering. This depiction of the fire of God on the summit of the altar is a microcosmic representation of the fire of God that appeared on the summit a Har Sinai. If we go back here to Exodus 24, verse 16, look what it says. It says, Umar e kevodadanai ke eish o chelet berosh hahar. The appearance of the glory of Hashem was like a consuming fire on the mountaintop. Le'enei b'nei Israel before the eyes of the children of Israel. So in other words, the same image that the Jews saw on Mount Sinai was identical to what they were seeing on the altar in the temple and in the Mishkan. This is profound. This reveals that the experience one experiences at the altar was identical to experiencing Hashem on Har Sinai. That's powerful. A further development of this concept is that the altar and the sanctuary needed to have a yesod. It had to have a foundation. It had to have a foundation. Why? This teaches us that the course okay, that we should choose for ourselves is to elevate all our earthly powers to Hashem. And to do this, we must stand firmly on the foundation of the altar. And this is the law for when we bring our korban, or literally to draw near to Hashem. And so through the avodot, or through the blood, the life force, our soul will learn the way to ascend to Hashem. By the way, for non-Jews, this law is also applicable to non-Jews. Because non-Jews were also permitted to bring a korban, a gift to Hashem. Because they were able to draw near to Hashem by learning this secret in the altar. The non-Jew was required to learn and know Hashem as He's revealed in Israel. So this wasn't just limited to Jews, because the non-Jew who brought their gift to the altar would also experience the same experience as a Jew did, except they were not committed or obligated to the 613 mitzvot of the Torah. Now, Adjacent to the altar, as I explained before, was the Ohel Moet, right? It's the tenant meeting, as the Torah tells us here in Leviticus 1.5. This is adjacent to the tenant meeting. The tenant meeting, which would serve later what we call the Chechel, the sanctuary, and inside the sanctuary, it was custom to keep the doors open. You couldn't see the Kodesh, Kodeshin, the Holy of Holies, because that was blocked with the Paokit or the curtain. But you could see the altar, gold, and incense. You could see the menorah, and you can also see the Shochan Lechampani. Okay? Hidden behind the curtain, obviously, was the Aron Habarit, the Ark of the Covenant that housed the Luchot, the, tab the tablets of the Torah. When the individual brought the korban, they witnessed the stages of the shechita, kabbalat hadam, holacha, zericha, and whether it was ola, asham, chatat, uh, etc., they were silently witnessing the movements of the kohen move from one part of the altar, going from the north to the west, go up the small ramp, come around, go up the large ramp, bring the choice organs and the fat, consume it, look inside, and they would hear the music of the Levi'im in the background from the platform, the Dukin. They would see 
the menorah in the south shining its light on the north with the bread, they were having a very sublime psychological experience. It's a spiritual experience, but it was affecting their psyche on a very deep level. This juxtaposition of the altar with the Ohel Moed, it reveals that the altar derived its meaning from the sanctuary. The west side of the west, the west side of the altar, backing up here, that represents the Aron, the Ark contained behind the Parochet, that represents the Torah, the west side. The south, it represents spiritual life, that is symbolic of the menorah. It was positioned to the south. The north. Okay, with the shochal lechem panim, that represents material life. The east side, okay, that was associated with where the people would come in. And if you know the layout in Yerushalayim today, the east gate, which is barricaded, it's in the side where the Muslims are, that's the sha'ah harachamim, that's the gate of mercy. That was where the people would come up through, and they would be enveloped in this very deep mystical experience. It was through the East Gate that people would come to experience Hashem via the Korbanot. These sides all converge with the altar via the corners. The southwest corner represents a spiritual life that flows from the Torah. The southeast corner represents a nation whose source is in the spiritual life and whose direction is in the Torah. The northeast corner represents material prosperity that is developed through the powers of the nation. And the northwest corner represents material plentifulness that is dedicated to the Torah and whose source is the nation uplifted by the spirit of Torah. Any progress towards perfection as embodied in the Korban Olah, any cleaving to heights already attained can be achieved only by the combination of all these aspects. The Torah must be the source of the spiritual. The spiritual must awaken the consciousness of Am Israel as its national mission can only be found in the Torah. Only in the spirit of such consciousness are material property and life to be pursued. And all property and material life must be dedicated to the fulfillment of the Torah. The drawing near to Hashem via the Korbanot that is learned from the altar, particularly the ascent to such heights, are matters of spirit and consciousness. And so, though the front of the altar, okay, is in the south, and I'll bring this back up on the screen, because the ramp is positioned on the south side, that's also the side of the menorah, all right? The back of the altar faces the north, all right? The north which is associated with the Hechel inside with the Lechapani and the Shochan, that represents material wealth. Now I just mentioned, or I mentioned in previous teachings, that all Korbanot were divided into two categories. The first category is called Kodesh Kodeshim, it's called the Most Holy, and the second is called the Kodeshim Kalim, the Lesser Holy. While all Korbanot, don't get it twisted, they're holy, the Torah teaches that the Korbanot classified as Kodeshim Kodeshim have stricter rules than those classified as Kodeshim Kalim. The category of the Kodeshim Kodeshim include the Korban Chatat, Korban Ola, Korban Asham, and the communal Shalemim, as well as the two bird Korbanot. Now, according to the Halakha, all Kodeshim Kodeshim needed to be slaughtered in the northern part of the courtyard which is on the back side of the altar here. And even though these korbanot were categorized as katshe kharashin, they had a common feature. They were brought for some type of failure in one's life. A failure. For this reason, the animal to be offered needed to be placed on the north side, the side that symbolizes materialism and sensuality. Somebody failed in misappropriating money, their gifts, their talents, etc. that's more associated with the world. And there, via the Korban, its selfish existence would be ended via Shechita, through slaughtering, which was to have an impact upon the person's soul. Through the process of Shechita, it would then enter the higher existence of the sanctuary through Kabbalat Hadam, receiving of the blood via the Klisharet, and so any lack of moral progress or moral stability has its roots in the material and the sensual. 
cessation of uncontrolled sensual existence and entrance into the sphere of the sanctuary are prerequisites for repairing any moral deficiency. Once sensuality, which is embodied by the animal, is slaughtered, it awaits a moral resurrection. And so towards this end, it is brought to the south. It transfers from the north to the south, where it is to be enlightened by the light of the spirit, which represents the menorah, and the hechel, where the blood would be poured on the yesod. The Cohen's movement of Holacha, taking the blood from south to then the east, he would move around the altar, was to teach the person that they were a part of the nation, the Torah. With the blood being tossed against the northeast corner, it was assigned its first active task. The utilization of material and sensuary, sensory powers and relating to the national community. And so in this manner, the material and the sensory attain their first sanctification. The liberation of the material and senses are released from the bonds of bodily drives to begin to ascend in moral freedom. Once again, the process of offering a korban, literally drawing near to Hashem, began on the north side of the altar, right? The north side. The north side represents material life, money, okay? If we can use that in today's terms. Money in Jewish thought that is that is earned to benefit oneself, okay, oneself alone is no higher than the food that an animal takes to eat. However, if money that is earned for the sake to support others or to support oneself to help others for a godly initiative, then it belongs to the realm of moral freedom, which is the realm of love and kedusha, holiness. It's not enough for a person to regard himself as part of the community. Right? I'm a part of the Jewish people. No. He must be aware of the mission of the people collectively, according to the Torah. The Torah, does, the Torah, if you will, does not call for the elimination of material wealth and sensory powers. No. Instead, it teaches us to utilize the material and the senses for the realization of God, to reveal the spark of Hashem through. The sensory life that is slaughtered in the north and attains its enlightenment in the south, and rises in the godly human resurrection, which represents consciousness. Because this all is impacting the mind. It's on a conscious level here. It's impacting the soul. This human being, symbolized by the korban, being a combination, a hybrid, a material and spiritual, continues to circle to the right around the altar, and so on his passage from the north to the west, he learns to consecrate all powers in his possessions to Hashem. All that has been set before him on the table of his life is to be dedicated to the fulfillment of the Torah, which rests beneath the wings of the cherubim, the cherubim, a keruf, to draw near. This is his whole life's purpose. And with the tossing of the blood against the southwest corner, he is assigned a second task. He is to be enlightened with his spirit to the Torah, to meditate on it day and night, as this is a condition for any ascent to moral heights. And in closing, I want to point something out that was very interesting, and particularly in regards to the positioning of the altar. Part of the altar, if you did not know, it was built and some of the territory of Sheva bin Yamin, in the territory of the tribe of Benjamin, as well as in the territory of the tribe of Yehuda. All right? And you'll see here in the screen, the area that's kind of in the pinkish red down there with Yehuda, that was Yehuda's territory. But I want you to notice, it's in a territory where there's no Yesod, the south and the east side. There's no Yesod, where Benjamin, the remaining part of the temple grounds, is in his territory, which would also include the Yesod of the west and also the north. Why? There's a profound lesson here. The Torah is teaching us something deep. Kingship in Israel should be permeated with the spirit of the Torah. Jewish history, in the past, the people, sadly, were not worthy to possess this union of power and spirit. It will only be in the future, 
in the future that the altar will then rest in a realm of kingship under what we call Mashiach, but Mashiach is not just limited to an individual, it's a state of consciousness of the entire people because Mashiach is the collective consciousness of Am Israel. And we find this alluded to in Zechariah 6, 12-23. V'amat elav, Zechariah receives a word from Hashem. Say to him, to who? Le'mor ko amar adonai sevaot. So says Hashem, Master Allegiance. Lemor hine ish semach shemo. Behold, a man called semach, the branch, shall what? Shall branch out yitzmach uvana. Okay, from the place where he is at hechal Adonai, and he shall build the sanctuary of Hashem. And it says that vehu yivne et hechal Adonai vehu yisa. Hold Vishav Umashal Al Kiso Vahaya Kohen Al Kiso. He shall build the temple of Hashem, the sanctuary, literally in Hebrew, and shall assume majesty, and he shall sit on his throne in rule, and there shall also be what? A Kohen seated on his throne, and harmonious understanding shall prevail. Shalom, Tiye Ben Shinehim, between them. Between them. In other words, Israel, unfortunately, never was able to arise to that level, that conscientious level. But there will be a time, may it be speedily in our days, that this does happen, that the collective consciousness of Am Israel attains this level of being a mamlech kohenim, a kingdom of priests. And so with that said, Chavarim, that's going to bring us to a close for my teaching here on Parashat of Vayichra. I truly hope that this teaching has been insightful to you. And if you are familiar with some of my other teachings on this topic and where I explained in detail that the Mishkan, the Kalim and the Mishkan are nothing but a microcosm of man, that this also explains in even more detail, enlightens your understanding of it, that Without a physical temple, without Corbinot, they, these things are still relevant because the movements of the Kohen, what he did with the blood and what it did and putting on the altar, all of the symbolism really has a deep meaning in the psyche of man that we still are able to derive benefit from it here and now without physical slaughtering of animals, things of that nature. And so if it's your first time hearing this, I challenge you and encourage you to take a look at my other teachings on this topic as well. You can find them on our channel. And uh, once again, if anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, if I have the time to get back to you uh, through the emails I got, I will make sure I do respond in swiftly time. And once again, if our organization is a blessing to you, our teachings here, and you would like us to continue broadcasting and sharing with you, uh, prayfully consider donating. You can find a link to support us directly below the video. And once again, we are Machon, we are an institute. We do offer teachings outside of our free public teachings here on our YouTube channel. And if you'd like to learn more, you can head on over to our website. You can uh, send us an email as well, and we will get back to you as soon as possible. So until next time, Chavari, Medigal of Avraham, Yitzach, and Yaakov, bless you and your family. Shalom. Amen.